just so that there was no association with the Jewish people anymore. So that's where the word came from. But there are no Palestinian people. There never was any Palestinian money. There's no Palestinian anything over there. Nothing. There never was. And this thing about all these millions of people that are as refugee camps, well, guess what? There were some people in there in that land. Don't dispute that. There were some Palestinians, as there were Jews, as there were Christians. And the Muslims, what happened is, in 1948, when they were reestablished, the day that they reestablished as a nation, every Muslim nation on earth proclaimed war against Israel that day. Okay? And so what they did is they told these people, move out. We're going to go in, we're going to kill all the Jews, and then you're going to get this land. Okay? So all of the Palestinians started to leave, and the Jewish people said, don't go. Don't go. We've got the recordings that say this. We want to live in this land with you. You're our neighbors, right? No, we're moving out. So all these people voluntarily at the, at the uh, uh, request of the Muslim nations that were attacking them went in. They all took off and they went over to Jordan, all these refugee camps, and there they sit multiplying, breeding by the huge numbers of, and it's their descendants that say, we own this land, when in fact they were told don't leave. Stay with us and build a nation with us. And the ones that did stay are citizens. They have the same rights as the Jewish people. Everything. So don't believe this lie. I, I, you know, I, I take it very passionately because history is grounded in truth, but people believe the lie rather than the truth. So you need to do your history on that. And the church is somehow uh, uh, fooled by this as well. A lot of denominations, oh, you know, the Jewish people don't deserve this and that. None of this surprised God. None of this. It is all recorded very clearly in this book. And it's also recorded by extra biblical characters throughout the years that have done this. And they are there for a reason. Jesus is a Jew. He was born a Jew, he died a Jew, he was resurrected a Jew, and he will return to this land and he will still be a Jew. That will never change in all of eternity. These are his people. And when they say in Matthew 24, he's talking about the sheep and the goats. I think it's Matthew 24. Anyway, he says, uh, on that day I'm going to divide the sheep from the goats. And uh, he says, you come into my inheritance, you who... Uh, uh, you know, you saw me, I was hungry, and you fed me, and I was thirsty, and you gave me water, and I was in jail, and you visited me. And they, says, they said, well, when did we do this? It's when you, uh, what you did for the least of my brothers, that's, you did it for me. He's talking about the Jewish people. He's not, that's not an application in the church at all. That has nothing to do with us. Now, a lot of church prison ministries go out and we say, well, Jesus said we're supposed to go visit people in the, the, the prisons. Well, that's fine. No problem with that. But that's not who Jesus was talking about. He was talking about his brothers, the Jewish people. Because you have to remember, and this is one thing that we talk about in this class so that we have the doctrine sound, is that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were all under what covenant? They were under the Old Testament. They were not under the New Testament. They're in the New Testament. But they were not Jesus every thing that he did until the night that he was crucified was under the Old Testament, not under the New. Every word he spoke was to the Jewish people, not to the church. The church was a mystery, and Paul even says that in his writings. The mystery is now revealed in Christ, in his resurrection. And that's why on the night of his re uh, crucifixion, he says, this is the new covenant in my blood. Until that time, nobody... So everything that you read in the gospel accounts applies to the Jewish people, not to the Christians. And, but it's very hard to get that out of our minds because for 15, 1800 years, we've been saying, well, this is all us. This is all, and it's not. It has nothing to do with us. It doesn't mean that it doesn't apply to us, but it was not spoken to us. Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles, the people that are now in God's graces. And that's why we believe in what's called dispensationalism rather than covenantal theology. Dispensationalism means that God had a dispensation of grace in the Garden of Eden. Okay? They were under grace and uh, God says, uh, actually it was a, it's not the dispensation of grace, it's the dispensation of anyway, there's a term for it. In Eden he gave them one commandment, one negative commandment don't do this thing. They failed. Okay? After that comes the uh, time from Adam until Noah. They have another dispensation. And then from Noah to the time of Abraham you have another dispensation, all right? Abraham comes in, and we, uh, he's made the promise. The, we're waiting on the promise, and then comes the Mosaic Law. This carried on all the way until we get to Jesus. 
But in the middle of that, we have what's called the Davidic covenant. So he makes a promise to David that somebody from his seed, this person was made a promise, this person was made a promise, Isaac and Israel were made a promise, and then Judah is eventually, we can infer in there, that the, the, it's going to come through G Judah. And then from Judah, uh, actually, I, should, I think I should put this, no, it's before Moses. Anyway, and then all this is doing is it's pointing to someone, one person that's coming. And it gets, it branches out for a while, and then it gets more direct. And it branches out, and then it gets more direct. And that's what's going on. And finally, we get the Davidic covenant. It's not only the tribe of Judah, but it's the son of David. And then comes Jesus, fulfills everything that's prophesied here. But this is who he's speaking to. And so, I, I, any question on that before we go on? What's that? I said, I've never heard of Oh, okay. All right. I, I, I must have not said it in this class. I must have said it in the Saturday class. But, oh, well, that's all right. But um, uh, one other thing that's interesting, and I'll bring it up because I brought in the, the thing about the land, is that in addition to the, um, uh, the land being barren, there's only one rainy year, as I said. We have in the Bible what's called the former and the latter rains. Okay? The former rains are, I, I believe, in... Uh, October and then the latter rains are in April and that's you have to have these two rains to have the harvest not only planted but to survive through the entire harvest period until it's time to harvest right so you get the former and the latter rains which is brought on by the clouds building up moisture and then dropping it on the land right well when the Romans came through they cut down every single tree in the land Mark Twain will confirm that. It's just, he said it was like being on the surface of the moon, although he didn't have any idea what it was like. I mean, that's the comparison he makes. It's just barren here. Well, what did the Jews do? Not only did they drain the swamps, but they also, year after year, they have been one of the, I believe, the only nation on earth that has had a net gain of trees year after year since it was established. But they've planted all these trees, right, all over the land, billions and billions and billions of trees, right? And what did that do? It finally, after 2,000 years, it brought back two rains. Instead of one rainy year, they have two rains. And so now they have what the former and the latter rains again, which was prophesied in the Old Testament. And if you go to the book of James, one of the very few, I believe, New Testament prophecies outside of the book of Revelation is, um, let me see if I can find it real quickly here. I don't want to spend all day on this. Uh, I've got a brand new Bible I'm using today, and so I don't have things... Uh, it's in a different layout. You kind of got to look for it, but it's in um, Forest Fire. Uh, James, and if you see, um, speaking of the farmer who is uh, uh, planting his crops, anyway, uh, where is that? I thought it? Yeah, establish your hearts. Oh, here it is. Okay, so it's um, James 5, and then it says here in verse 7, Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. So he's speaking now about the coming of Jesus. All right, Jesus is going to come down. And it says here, See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and the latter rain. Well, at that time, there was an early and a latter rain. And then for 2,000 years, just after this book was written, about 40 years later, they cut down these trees. No more early and latter rain. And it says, waiting patiently for it until it receives early and latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts for the Lord's coming is at hand. In other words, I believe that when you see the latter rains coming, the former and latter rains coming, the Lord's coming is at hand. Well, it's finally returned to the land of Israel. Israel is the time. Some people say that um, God's uh, watch or God's timing is set by Israel. In other words, you can see the prophetic fulfillment of the world and everything racing towards its end based on Israel. Now, I, I disagree with that in the sense that that's limiting God to Israel. Rather, I would say that God uses Israel as a timepiece for us. You see the difference, the semantics there. But I, I, God doesn't wait on Israel. God directs Israel. So his timing is through the people of Israel. Anyway, other than that, it's a, it's a good analogy. And so I believe that Israel is the key to that. Okay, so we're, we're kind of done with that. And so we can go ahead and get started again. Very interesting verses coming up. Go ahead. Oh, I don't know. Where were we? Um, oh, 13. What? 35, 13. Yep. Okay. 
Then God went up from him in the place where he had spoken with him. Okay, and then as I said before, we've seen this once, maybe twice already, and we're going to see it again and again. God went up from him. And if you go, like, I'll just turn there real quickly and I'll read it to you. It's in the book of Judges, and it's the account of um, when Joshua judges. It's, uh, this is just one example. The term went up. I mean, he literally was manifest there in front of uh, Israel. Although it doesn't say it there, it does say he went up from them. And where am I going? Oh, this one doesn't have that either. Um, well, this is going to make it a little harder. Uh, um, we, we're looking for the birth of Samson in the book of Judges. And let me see here, Manoah. Okay, here it is. It's in 13, and then we're going to go to um, uh, the angel of the Lord came to um, uh, the father and mother of who Samson would be. They didn't have children at the time, but eventually the Lord came in uh, to them. And uh, it, after he gave the promise and they asked a couple questions of him, it says, So Manoah took the young goat offering, goat with the grain offering, and offered it upon the rock to the Lord, and he did a wondrous thing while Manoah and his wife looked on. It happened as the flame went up toward heaven from the altar, the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame of the altar. Okay? And that's kind of the same picture that we're getting in the verse we just read here. The Lord is there. What's that? What was that? That was in Judges 13. Hang on a sec. 20, okay. And you're going to see that throughout the Old Testament several times. Where, and What is that a picture of, though? It's somebody else did the same basic thing later. Well, he ascended. He ascended. We're getting ready to do Jesus. He ascended at, at the ascension on the Mount of Olives. He went up from them. The, how people miss the symbolism from the Old Testament to the New is beyond me. Jesus, at the ascension, you know what I'm talking about in the book of Acts. It says he spoke to them and finally they looked, it, it, he ascended in the cloud and they were looking up and the two people came up and says, why are you uh, standing here looking up? The same Jesus that came, went up from you will come back in like manner. Okay, anyway, the Lord ascends. Well, what is this? This is a pre, uh, a, 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 the eternal Christ. This is Christ visiting earth before he became incarnate, or maybe he was already incarnate, but he's going back in time somehow, whatever. This is actually the Lord, because it says in the New Testament that no man has seen God, or can see God. So it must be Jesus that's being revealed in the Old Testament again and again and again. We're going to see that in the book of Joshua here shortly too. But, that well, that not shortly, that'll be about 16 years. It proves his personal and bodily presence. That's right. That's right. In, in the account we're reading here in Genesis, that's absolutely right. It's the same thing as the angel of the Lord appearing to Abraham, and uh, it, it proves it. And so he was there. Now, here's one thing, and the people in this class know I believe this. I'm not saying this is right, so please don't take this as doctrine, because I don't know anybody else that thinks this in the world except me. But I, 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 I can't get this out of my head, is that I do not believe in a pre-incarnate Christ. It seems like a contradiction to me. I believe that the Jesus we're seeing in the Old Testament is the Jesus that was in the New Testament. And somehow, because he has ascended to the Father, he is outside of the time and space and matter that he created. And I believe that that is him going back in time and actually intervening in his own history. I don't know how he does it. Don't get me wrong. I could be entirely wrong on that. But I cannot personally comprehend a pre-incarnate Christ. It doesn't make any sense. If you believe in the Trinity, how can you? That's right. That's, so, I, it, to me, it is Jesus Christ. He is God. And somehow he always went... Always has been. Always has been. That's right. Okay. So, anyway, don't, don't take me... Uh, um, you know, anyway, just think that through on your own. And I've never solidified it, but that's just how I look at that. Okay. So, he uh, went up from him. And then in uh, verse 14, Lil... And Jacob set up, a, uh, set up a pillar in the place where he'd spoken with him, a pillar of stone, and he poured out a libation on it. He also poured oil on it. Which is exactly what he did before he went up to Padamaram. He slept on the stone, had the vision, woke up, and anointed the stone. So now he's making a permanent altar rather than just a stone. Okay, same place, same, same, uh, same thing that he's doing. Okay. So Jacob named the place where God had spoken with him Bethel. Bethel, which is the house of God. Okay, now from verse 16 to verse uh, 20. Go, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to interrupt you until you read 16 through 20, and I want to see if you see anything in there. 
okay? And then when we're done, we're going to talk about it. Go ahead.